So good morning. Thank you for joining us at our Passport to 2044 session on planning for critical areas. I'm Maggie Moore, a senior planner at the Puget Sound Regional Council. And at PSRC, we are really helping to provide resources to help you create local plans that advance our regional goals. And to do so, we provide a series of guidance documents and resources that we've been working on and releasing over the past couple of years, and we are continuing to do so. Um, and in addition to these guidance and resources coming from PSRC, we are partnering with the State Department of Commerce and other agencies, as well as the Municipal Research and Services Center to provide these Passport to 2044 events. So in addition to all of the great information you'll hear later at the session today, MRSC also has some resources on critical areas that I will provide in the chat and we'll make available on our website. Today's session is um, one in the much larger Passport to 2044 series. So we have held seven sessions already this year. We have one more in 2022 on TOD in centers coming up in December. And then in 2023, we are planning a session on housing needing capacity, a second session on equity, and then working on a session that will be for elected officials and planning commissioners. But today's session on planning for critical areas, we have a really robust agenda, so I want to get into those presentations. We have staff and experts from the Washington State Departments of Commerce, Health, Ecology, Natural Resources, and Fish and Wildlife. So a lot of present great presentations for you today. Uh, and we are recording today's session, so you'll be able to go back and watch it at your convenience, as well as share it with others who may be interested. We'll also be posting all of these presentations that you're seeing today on our website, so you'll be able to follow links within those presentations, and we'll send those out to everyone who registered for today's event once they're available. We're also going to be doing a Q&A at the end of today's session, so throughout the presentations, please ask any questions you may have into the Q&A box on Zoom. And then at the very end, we are going to have a Title VI survey pop up, which is just asking demographics so we have a better understanding of who is joining us today. So in um, spirit of getting started and getting into all of these presentations, I am going to pass it off to Scott Cooktoff from the Department of Commerce to talk about requirements under the Growth Management Act on planning for critical areas. Let's see here. Let me get this started. How's that look? I am not seeing your screen share. Oh, sorry. How about now? Still no. I am happy to bring it up for you if needed. Interesting. Let me try one more time here. Apologies. Yeah, it looks like you might have to. Okay, I will do that. I wish we could blame this on the snow, but I don't think we can today. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry for that delay. My name is Scott Kukta. I'm a senior planner with the Washington State Department of Commerce and Growth Management Services. I provide planning technical assistance to Eastern Washington counties and cities and am the critical areas policy lead for our agency. Um, next slide. So just in case you're wondering if it's really required to do a critical areas review as a part of your periodic update. Rest assured, it is a requirement. And here's the uh, GMA citations. Uh, just in general, all uh, you're supposed to do take legislative action for any uh, comp plan update or regu de development regulation update as a part of your periodic update, and that includes a consideration of critical area ordinances. So here's the here's a reference to the Act uh, reference to the the GMA reference. Sorry. Next slide. Next uh, slide. Uh, one reason you want to make sure to get your updates completed is that you want to make sure you're uh, eligible for grants and loans. And 
the GMA does provide a grace period for completing your critical areas regulations. So you are considered to be making substantial progress towards your periodic update if you are if you have completed your comprehensive plan and your development regulations within your um, statutory deadline. So for P Central Puget Sound jurisdictions, that's December of 2024. And you have an extra 12 months built in to complete your critical areas review. So within that 12 months time frame, if you have completed all of your other work, you are still considered to be eligible for grants and loans such as um, RCO, um, Department of Ecology's water quality grants, all pretty much any state uh, grant and loan program. Next slide, please. So our recommended update, update process is do not wait to get started. Oftentimes critical areas are pushed off to the end of your update process. Uh, we recommend getting in, getting started early at least. Uh, you know, you can conduct a best available science review. That's a critical part of getting uh, to understanding what uh, needs to be updated in your critical areas regulations. We have a critical areas checklist that is just being finished and should be live on our website early next week. Uh, there might be some other agency checklists you'll hear about later in this presentation, and we recommend that you reach out to state agencies early in the process. They're more than happy to help look at your current regulations and see where they might be gaps and some recommendations to, to make some changes. Next slide. Commerce resources that we have available. Well, first, any anytime you have any growth management questions, we recommend that you contact your regional uh, growth management planner. And we have a map and a list of planners who are assigned to your jurisdiction on our on our website. So uh, consult with that map. You can always contact me. My information is on this uh, um, at the end of this presentation. So please get in touch with me if you have any questions as well. We have a critical areas handbook that is uh, just about done being updated. We should have that done in the early part of next year. We've made some updates throughout the chapters. In particular, we've made some updates to chapter seven, which is monitoring and adaptive management. Again, we have our critical areas checklist and all of this information is available on either our periodic update webpage or our critical areas webpage. Next slide. We have also Com nearly completed a, a pretty significant update to our growth management rules. We anticipate an early 2023 adoption. Uh, some of the um, rule changes that uh, impact critical area review is that, you know, we're em emphasizing avoidance as the best way to protect critical areas. Sometimes we just want to jump from avoidance to uh, whatever the pro project proposal is. Um, and we really want to make sure that the it's clear that the best way to protect critical areas is to avoid the impacts uh, as, a, as the first part of that mitigation um, process. Uh, we've clarified that you must conduct a BAS review, uh, best available science review, and that can be tailored to the scope of, of the update or the changes that you're making to your regulations. We've emphasized permit monitoring and adaptive management. Uh, and we are encouraging that. It's not a requirement of the Growth Management Act. Um, and if you're basing your regulations on best available science, but um, we definitely want to make uh, encourage monitoring and adaptive management. And then we've emphasized that all critical area functions must be protected. And this is based on uh, numerous uh, hearing sport cases and court cases. Next slide. I want to draw your attention to a couple of recent CAO appeals that you might take a look at, Ian Munson and Evergreen Islands versus City of Anacortes, and then Yakima Nation versus Kittitas County. We don't have time to go into the details of these cases. There are a number of issues highlighted in both of them, and I believe both of them have been appealed to, um, to the Superior Court or the Court of Appeals. I had trouble finding any schedules for those, but uh, in, the, in the case of Ian Munson, only a portion of the um, of the hearing sport decision was appealed, but I believe right now Anacortes is in compliance with the hearing sport case. And then the Yakima Nation, the hearing sport found the Kittitas County in compliance, but we understand that that's been appealed, I believe, to Thurston County uh, Superior Court. Next slide. That's all for me. And uh, again, 
please contact me if you have any questions or your regional planner, and I will be handing it off to Carl Whitaker with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thanks. Thank you, Scott, and thanks to our organizers of today's workshop and to all of our participants. I'm Kara Whitaker with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And just give me a moment to start sharing my screen. Hopefully it will work. All right, I think that I'm going to start from the beginning. And it's a little bit hidden here. I think I got it. All right. Does that look good, Maggie? Yeah, it looks great. Fantastic. All right. I think I'm going to move this over. Okay. Uh, it would be, it's my pleasure to uh, be here today to present to you a brief introduction to fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. Uh, like I said, I am with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, and I am the Land Use Conservation and Policy Section Manager. And the section is where we focus on growth management and shoreline management. I'm going to cover two primary topics in my uh, talk today. Uh, first, I'll be covering some of the requirements and definitions under the Growth Management Act for fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. And I'd like to uh, draw your attention to these acronyms because they will be used frequently. Uh, and then my second major topic is how WDFW helps local governments designate and protect fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas, uh, primarily through our Priority Habitats and Species program, as well as technical assistance that we provide. All right, on to the first section, the Growth Management Act, Fish and Wildlife Habitat Conservation Area, Requirements and Definitions. So the, uh, some of the uh, broader but essential requirements under the Growth Management Act uh, for critical areas is first uh, to designate them and followed by protecting them so that their functions and values are protected, as Scott uh, first described to you in his presentation. Uh, and to do so, you must include the best available science and give special consideration to anadromous fisheries. This is one of the reasons for having the periodic update because new science is developed and synthesized over time and then must be incorporated over time. Also, uh, as you designate and protect critical areas, uh, your regulations must allow for no net loss of ecosystem functions and values, and they must support viable connected populations of species over the long term. So I'll be next going in more detail on the designation step, the first step, and some of the minimum designation guidelines. So your uh, job as city or county planners is to determine the lands that have a primary association with the protected species and adopt regulations protecting them. Uh, the first primary mechanism for doing so are to use the performance standards for different habitat and species. And these are criteria based uh, and kind of the, the broadest level. But we advise you to go uh, to more detail and use maps to, uh, to provide the general locations of species and habitats for protection. Uh, and an example I provide here is from the city of Anacortes. Uh, they have an online interactive map uh, where you can pull up the various fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. But these are still uh, general locations. Uh, when you get to the project level and the site scale is when you get to more uh, specific delineation on the ground. Uh, there are, is a long list of types of areas that need to be designated. I'll just introduce a few of them here starting with state and federally listed and sensitive species, our WDFW priority habitats and species, DNR rare plants and ecological communities, and habitats and species of local importance, 
For example, say you know, your jurisdiction has a heron rookery or a seal haul out, uh, things like that. And there are a number of other specified areas and considerations uh, for you as you're in the designation process. The next step is protection and determining uh, how to protect the areas that you've designated. Uh, and uh, the reason that we're all here today is for critical areas uh, updating uh, and guidance, but other mechanisms are available, such as development densities that vary, uh, urban growth area boundaries uh, that are adjusted, open space corridors, uh, are some other regulatory mechanisms, but these are complemented well by incentive-based land conservation and stewardship programs as well. In all these cases, uh, it's crucial that impacts to critical areas are first avoided, uh, then minimized and fully mitigated uh, so that no net loss of ecological functions results. A few other laws also affect fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. At the federal level, there's the Endangered Species Act for a range of marine and anadromous species, as well as terrestrial and freshwater species. And other federal laws, such as the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And I refer you to the Critical Areas Handbook for further resources on these uh, and many other topics on all the critical area types. All right, on to the, the second major section of my talk today is on how WDFW helps local governments designate and protect fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. Uh, the primary uh, way we do so is through our PHS program, Priority Habitats and Species. Uh, we have two different tools to start with for designation, our PHS list and PHS maps. And that's followed by two additional tools available for protecting um, these areas, including our management recommendations and technical assistance. So I'll describe each of those four. I don't have time today to talk about monitoring and adaptive management, but another speaker uh, will cover that for me. All right, so starting with PHS list, uh, this uh, has a couple different forms. Uh, the, the PDF is available, uh, and well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, the list is a criteria-based and vetted, uh, and includes a broad range of habitats and species, as well as uh, groups of priority species. And it is updated on a regular basis. Uh, and within the, uh, the PDF, version of the list, you have, uh, for example, county level distribution maps and indication of state and federal listing status for the species, as well as their primary association areas. Uh, examples there include um, special breeding areas, uh, roosting, uh, say seal haulouts and rookeries. Some of the examples I provided earlier are considered association areas. All right, the next tool for designation is our PHS on the web. This is a, a way you can go um, zoom in on your location of interest uh, spatially. And uh, when you click on a particular area, um, you get a hit basically of the uh, polygons of priority habitat and species in that location. And you also can generate a report that includes uh, the attribute data and much more information in tabular format. Uh, another option available is to request the PHS uh, digital data to include in your GIS um, when you sign a non-disclosure agreement to uh, ensure that sensitive species are fully protected. There are a few caveats to our PHS on the web data is that not all types of priority habitats are uh, displayed. And uh, obviously species move around and they do exist in places that we haven't surveyed yet. Uh, so it's important to use uh, this information as a flagging tool at this scale, and then to validate the information at the site scale. Onto our management recommendations for protecting uh, fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. 
I'd like to direct your attention to these uh, two documents that have been around for some time, um, but they uh, are still highly relevant and useful. Um, the landscape planning for biodiversity in developing areas, and then land use planning for salmon, steelhead, and trout uh, more specifically. Uh, then there are additional, more specific management recommendation documents available too for certain habitats and species. And then more recently in 2020, we published two volumes of uh, our riparian ecosystem recommendations. Uh, first, volume one is a synthesis of the best available science. And then we use that to develop volume two or the, the recommendations for management within riparian management zones. Uh, so another acronym to become familiar with is the RMZ. And uh, we describe here how RMZs are really more than just your traditional buffers because they really are intended to provide full uh, riparian ecosystem function the way that we uh, propose they are designed and protected. They do apply to all stream types, whether or not they are fish bearing or seasonal or perennial. And then our recommendations differ a bit uh, depending on your location, uh, if you're in a forested setting or ecoregion versus a dry land or more arid uh, setting, such as the Columbia Plateau. So I'll provide you with an example of uh, how we would delineate an RMC in a forested ecoregion which includes pretty much all of Western Washington and parts of Eastern Washington. So we, we start here with the active channel and we're accustomed, many of us, to using the ordinary high water mark as the edge of a buffer. But, and that may be the case for some water bodies, but in many cases, there's also a channel migration zone present where the active channel will eventually move over time. Uh, this will be your next acronym, a CMZ. So if there's a CMZ present, then the edge uh, is where we begin the RMZ, the riparian management zone. Uh, and we use a term called the site potential tree height at 200 years uh, to determine the width of the RMZ uh, from out to the edge because the it's the average uh, maximum height that the dominant tree species can reach at age of 200. And those at that width, the trees can still influence uh, what occurs in the structure and functions of the riparian areas. So uh, there are some cases where it's not possible to uh, set aside the site potential tree height 200. Uh, in those cases, at least a minimum of 100 feet uh, RMZ width is recommended for the pollution removal function. We have an online tool uh, that is available now to show you what the site potential tree height is in your location. All right, we also provide technical assistance to local governments because this is a lot of complex information and we have uh, very talented habitat biologists available as a resource to you. Uh, you can go to our areas of responsibilities map, uh, locate your jurisdiction, click on it, and the contact info information will pop right up there. And uh, for those of you in the four Puget Sound Central Counties in regions four and six, uh, we you should have already heard from your habitat biologists or a regional office um, to offer support in the prior periodic update. Uh, so, pl but please do start with our management recommendation documents. Um, start with your best available science review and be patient as uh, we respond to come to assist you. Uh, we have uh, uh, some new PHS information also coming out uh, next year. Uh, and so in terms of riparian guidance uh, and tools for implementation, uh, we uh, are developing a, a checklist for riparian management zones and updating critical areas ordinances. And we also have more specific uh, PHS data forthcoming on site potential tree height with polygons that are representing um, those distances to, to aid in your planning purposes. 
And finally, we are expanding our coverage and our guidance uh, for our biodiversity areas and corridors data. And I uh, really would just want to point out how important these particular areas are uh, now more than ever, given climate-related shifts and habitat use and species range uh, now and, and more over time. So I'm going to wrap it up and um, remind you our Q&A will be at the end after all the presentations are completed. And next, I will be handing it off to Rick Moraz. He's with the Department of Ecology, and he'll be presenting to you today about wetlands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cara. <clears throat> the great job of highlighting the the GMA requirements for designating and protecting critical areas. You're going to make my job a lot easier, and presentation my presentation will touch on that as well um, with respect to wetlands. And, uh, See if I can launch this. And I think we're good. Are we, uh, Maggie, are we good? Yep, it looks great. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as Cara said, I'm Rick Moraz. I'm the Wetland Policy Lead for the Washington Department of Ecology. Um, in the context of the State Growth Management Act, ecology assists local governments in their efforts to incorporate best available science uh, when adopting critical areas regulations that aspire to protect wetland functions and values. Um, as you all probably already know, and as, as Scott and Carr have already mentioned, the, the GMA requires local governments to include best available science in developing policies and regulations. And as a part of our efforts to assist local governments, we've compiled and published BAS documents related to wetlands. We've published wetland guidance for CAO updates, and we review wetland chapters of draft CAOs. Um, if requested, we can also meet with local planning staff, consultants, and provide wetland presentations to advisory groups, planning commissions, and local elected officials. So I'm going to touch on our most recent updates to policy and guidance documents. Um, and also sort of take a quick look at some of the resources we've provided in general that are always available to you. Uh, a great place to start to find those resources for local governments engaged in GMA updates is on our wetland webpage. We have a dedicated page that is uh, titled Local Wetland Regulations, and it includes a number of things that are related to our guidance documents. You can find access to our best available science there as well. Um, the topics for today will be the two things that we've updated within the last couple of years, 2021 and 2022. We've been busy updating the Joint Agency Mitigation Guidance Document and our Wetland Guidance for CAO updates, so I'll spend my short amount of time focused on the recent stuff. Um, the, uh, the best available science documents that we've published uh, have been around for a little while. The first BAS document was published in 2005 in coordination with Department of Fish and Wildlife, and it was accompanied by our wetland guidance targeting CAO updates. Uh, we revisited the BAS in 2013, uh, re-examining the conclusions and key points made, and each conclusion was reviewed with respect to new information, and if the conclusion was valid, um, new references were added to support it, and if it needed to be modified or expanded, we put revised conclusions into this document. Both volumes are peer-reviewed and, and uh, by experts and the public. We began creating guidance for CAO updates under growth management in the early 90s, <clears throat> and in one form or another, the CAO guidance we've published has been used widely in counties and cities in Washington. Shown here are the, the 2016 version that many of you may be familiar with and our most recent on the right, the 2022 guidance. Um, the guidance contains detailed discussion on how to manage and protect wetlands, along with a sample ordinance that is written in a way that it can be incorporated into a CAO. Um, there are a number of advantages to using ecology's guidance. Uh, but two of the biggest reasons are the guidance is based on our review of BAS, and the approaches in the guidance have been upheld in growth management hearings board decisions. 
So I'll do a quick look at the uh, most uh, notable updates, the changes, if you will, in the current guidance. Um, many of the elements that have shifted a little bit in this most recent iteration are based on feedback we've received from local governments over the past six years. And our goals with this update were to improve clarity and ease of use, to provide more concrete examples of certain measures and approaches, and to incorporate BAS-based revisions. And as a preview, I'll just do some highlights. Uh, the one that's bolded here is a notation that um, identified that we actually changed the size of the low habitat bucket, if you will. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, these tables are probably familiar. They're the current version and the buffer widths um, on the left side reflect when minimization measures on a corridor use the buffer tables on the right or when they're not, so they get bigger. But the point I'm, I want to focus on is the uh, habitat bucket uh, for low habitat function has shifted what it used to be three to four, it is now three to five, um, and then the moderate habitat and uh, high habitat functions have um, stayed essentially the same. So these are this this change is a reflection of analysis that was done by Amy Yonke. She revisited our wetland, uh, our reference wetland data set, and the low habitat inflection point fit better at the five. So this is something that many of you may not have in your current CAO, um, and it is something that's in our current guidance. You'll also notice um, that we we have updated and expanded examples of minimization measures. This um, is a portion of the updated version of the minimization measures table. We received a lot of questions about this aspect of our guidance over the last years. And so we've added explanatory te text that should help with implementation. Um, a few of the key points about the table are bulleted. <clears throat> They're also written into the guidance, but most notably, it's not a complete list, uh, but hopefully it prompts these approaches. One is required, an applicant, a proponent for development is required to employ as many as feasible, not just one, uh, because this does wind up taking a buffer width from high intensity to moderate intensity land use, for example. It's up, up to local governments to check on these and, um, and to review whether these are actually being implemented the way they're supposed to, um, but ecology can provide technical assistance in the interpretation of these items if needed. Another highlight um, to the most current CAO guidance is that we've brought back in some of our other buffer approaches from our earlier guidance. We have um, the, what I, I will say, the simpler approaches, um, smaller jurisdictions, especially some we've recently worked with in Eastern Washington prefer very simple buffer approaches. So we've incorporated some of our earliest examples back into this guidance. As before, these approaches result in larger buffers for most wetlands because they don't include a more detailed consideration of specific wetland functions. So it takes a more protective approach, but it is simpler to implement. A few more items that are new to this CAO guidance update, the, uh, the concept of functionally disconnected buffers. Um, in some instances, and many of you can probably envision this, regulatory buffers overlay areas that are functionally disconnected from the wetland. This means that you get existing legally established development that blocks protective measures that a buffer provides and increasing the buffer on the far side of the development would add no protective benefit. Local CAOs should anticipate these situations, and we have provided detailed language on what would constitute a functionally disconnected buffer based on our analysis of the science. Um, and we've seen local governments try to make it run at this concept over the years, so we wanted to provide our, um, our sense of what that, how that should be implemented. In addition, corridors. Uh, Cara mentioned this, and the scientific literature continues to show that maintaining corridors and connectivity among habitats is very important. And our updated CAO guidance attempts to facilitate corridor networks when regulations are implemented. 
through expanding possible areas that qualify as corridors and that corridors connect to. And lastly, I'll segue to the incorporation of our mitigation guidance. That is now in the CAO guidance. It includes ratio tables and discussion of avoidance and minimization. So I want to talk about that next. This is an update to part one of our mitigation guidance that was originally published in 2006. And you may uh, note that this was a two-part set. Part two, which deals with how to develop mitigation plans, is not being updated at this time. Uh, but this is joint agency guidance. The Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, and Ecology developed this mitigation guidance cooperatively. And like our prior efforts, uh, this guidance aims at improving the quality and effectiveness of compensatory mitigation in Washington. The document is formatted to provide a primer on the regulatory process, an overview of the factors that go into state and federal agency permitting decisions, and detailed guidance on policies about wetland mitigation, particularly compensatory mitigation. It also outlines information agencies use to determine whether specific proposals are appropriate and adequate to compensate for proposed impacts. As a result, it has served as our guidance to local governments when evaluating proposals that impact wetlands. And in most instances, local governments adopt this as a part of their wetland section in their CAO updates. I want to highlight a few uh, of the specific changes to this one. But First, why did we do it? Um, a lot has changed since the first publication in 2006. Um, the federal mitigation rule went into effect in 2008. The state published a mitigation banking rule. We have published science and guidance documents on site selection. We've published guidance on how to develop advanced mitigation and how it's to be assessed. We published the credit debit method, which is a more quantitative way to determine if wetland functions are adequately replaced by compensatory mitigation. And another BAS update, we updated the, 20 to the wetland rating system in 2014. This is a very quick look at what's in it. Um, obviously it's a pretty big document, but I mentioned the regulatory process, how to prepare for it. Compensation approaches, methods like creation, restoration, enhancement, preservation are defined in detail. At times, I think a lot of uh, people, us included uh, over the years, have had to wrestle with whether something was rehabilitation or enhancement. And we've provided an extensive detailed description of those two terms and examples. Um, a tra chapter, chapter six is the real meat of the document, um, location of mitigation, site selection, how much you need, what sort of buffers are needed on mitigation sites, and what about resource trade-offs where wetlands are impacted and another aquatic resource is oft offered as compensatory. Some of the key messages, once again, um, provide corridors and connectivity to other habitats. Um, applicants proposing a wildlife habitat as a target function for a compensatory site should focus on a site that is part of an existing network of corridors and connections to other habitat patches. Um, in the absence of such things, the applicant may need to provide a much larger buffer around the mitigation site. The buffer will have to do more work providing habitat function. We've renewed and actually increased emphasis on avoidance and minimization. Scott spoke to this earlier. Um, wetland mitigation is usually implemented as a sequence of steps or actions. Compensatory mitigation is the step in the sequence that occurs after avoidance and minimization have been implemented. To really begin the conversation about mitigation, we have to focus on and emphasize the first two steps. In, in this state, permitting agencies are required to have applicants show they've followed the sequence. The CEPA rule also includes this language and work first to avoid and minimize impacts to wetlands wherever practicable. So we have increased our emphasis on it and we've also increased available tools. We have an avoidance and minimization page on the website. And on that page, we've provided tools 
<clears throat> we have developed an avoidance and minimization checklist. We don't want to play the bring me another rock game any more than anyone else. So we've produced this list that will walk through project assessment, site assessment, development modifications, and it can help the planners review a site and see, have you adequately addressed avoidance and minimization at all phases, phases of the project? You can provide it to an applicant and say, give me this filled out and show me that you've you've effectively avoided and minimized. Use the list. A couple more um, highlights uh, within the mitigation guidance is the we have established and, and clearly stated a preference to use that credit debit method um, as a tool in certain cases. If one is proposing an in lieu fee for mitigation, or if one is proposing preservation or enhancement only, um, it is a, a vital tool to determine if wetland functions are adequately replaced. Because in those instances, we're actually losing wetland area. Um, we've expanded sections on advanced mitigation. We've actually combined, if you will, the ratios for preservation and enhancement, because essentially to qualify for preservation, it has to be a high quality wetland and enhancement basically takes a lower quality wetland and adds typically vegetation to improve its its functions. So if there really is, again, the same sort of example, we've lost wetland area potentially, um, so the ratios are comparable. It's still neither are still a preferred approach, and we our guidance emphasizes that if one's going to take these approaches of preservation and enhancement, they should at least compensate for area at a one to one ratio. So, looking forward to this year and beyond, we are going to provide training on the uh, implementation of the mitigation guidance. It's actually just been posted on the Coastal Training Program's website for March. It'll be a four session class. And we'll continue to do outreach on the CAO guidance. And as I said, we're available. Um, there's a listserv here to show um, to, if you wanna follow what we're up to. Um, and in addition, please remember that our regional wetland specialists are all over the state. They're here to help you with project review, technical assistance, and review for critical areas ordinances. We can even review wetland delineations, wetland ratings, and mitigation plans. That is all I have. And now I'll pass the presenter role off to Nikki Gio with the Washington Department of Health. Thanks, Rick. How does that look? Looks great. Okay, perfect. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Critical Aquifer Recharge Areas. Um, my name is Nikki Gio. I'm with the Washington State Department of Health. I am the Program Manager for the Source Water Protection Program at Health, and I've been with the agency about six months, <laughs> so I'm pretty new, uh, but happy to be here with you all and talk more about critical aquifer recharge areas. I, I've been doing a lot of presentations, and I've been in clean water in some form or fashion for a long time, and I added a slide like this. I used to do a land acknowledgement, um, but... I read the, about this uh, Six Nations Thanksgiving address is what it's called. And over the weekend, over the holiday weekend, and I thought this would be really cool for my presentation. So um, the idea is that um, these tribal groups would have a, and it's not like a prayer or a poem, it's like ground rule to start any meeting. And so just giving thanks for water. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about water with Creek Log of Recharge Areas, um, but, it's also, you know, in trying to regulate water, it's very like reductionist and oversimplified and water is really, clean water is really a value that people have across the world and, and through many cultures. So I just wanna acknowledge that before I get going and encourage you to, to look more into this um, really interesting um, ground rules of, you know, thinking about our duty as living beings. So, 
my overview today, I'm going to talk a little bit about geology and hydrogeology, drinking water and contamination, critical aquifer recharge area um, in the Washington Administrative Code, the guidance from the Washington Department of Ecology, implementation tips, a little bit on monitoring, and a tiny bit on voluntary stewardship, because I only have 15 minutes. But um, the important thing to know is that uh, the Washington State Department of Health is not the lead for critical aquifer recharge area guidance. It's the Washington Department of Ecology. Um, the guidance comes from their agency, and we have a kind of an overlapping set of requirements with Safe Drinking Water Act, but the lead for ecology retired. So if you worked with Lori Morgan in the past, she retired, and they have not backfilled her position. So um, I'm going to cover this, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who's working on updates for CARAs, but um, ecology is still the primary um, technical lead. So the whole idea of critical aquifer recharge areas is thinking about in the landscape that all water is connected, right? So water that uh, what we're trying to do with our aquifers is recharge them. So the water that comes across the landscape, through the landscape, um, precipitation, we also have the groundwater and surface water interface you know, it's all connected. It's all one water. And CARAs are really interesting. Critical aquifer recharge areas are interesting because they tie together a lot of the other critical areas. So wetlands, fish and wildlife habitat areas, the frequently flooded areas and geologic hazard areas are often tied together in critical aquifer recharge areas. Um, CARAs are sort of the underlaying uh, critical areas. So we see, sometimes we see uh, projects come through on the CEPA registry and they say, oh, we don't have any uh, critical aquifer recharge areas, but when you look at where drinking water uh, wells are across the state, the likelihood that you're um, seeing a project come in that has no implications for groundwater is, is unlikely. Um, so the really what we're talking about with the value and function of critical aquifer recharge areas is to provide clean, safe, reliable drinking water, right? So all of these wells, um, and this is a from the um, DOH, uh, from our online mapping tool, but you can see that the public supply wells, um, they're all across the state. And so that vulnerability is really spread out. Uh, most people in the state of Washington uh, rely on groundwater for their drinking water supply. And DOH regulates uh, drinking water under Safe Drinking Water Act, but the critical aquifer recharge area is a complementary Washington specific set of requirements that can really help to protect those um, sources of water. So when we're thinking about critical aquifer recharge areas, it's important to think about geology and to look across the state. So if you think like even wherever you are in the state of Washington, uh, there's unconsolidated soils, right? And so the likelihood in that, that diagram, that you know uh, middle school science class diagram of the water cycle that connection of the soils and water to surface water and to um, you know land uses it's it there's vulnerability across the state so whether you're in western washington or eastern washington there are unconsolidated soils um, that are you know subject to contamination and when you overlay that with our drinking water well map you see there's just a lot of um, critical areas for drinking water in particular um and this you know, talking about the uh, landscape scale patterns, you know, to just think about, you know, you may have a project area that's in one geographic location, but these these landscape scale patterns, you know, they're, these other sites may be connected, thinking about the water body, surface waters, and groundwater. So this is a cross-section from the ecology guidance on critical aquifer recharge areas. And the cross-section is interesting because when you look at the soils map, you may think that there's like it's kind of one dimensional. And when you see the cross section, drinking water wells are the vertical black lines in this diagram. And so you can see that their drinking water wells are not just straws in a bathtub, right? That sort of concept of aquifers as just this reservoir underground. All of these different wells are at different depths. And so they have different um, vulnerabilities. And when we're thinking about um, critical aquifer recharge areas, there may be a, a gradient of risk, but there it's not ubiquitous. So it's not like a well is a well, you know, the depth in the soils really makes a big difference um, in the susceptibility to contamination. So the Washington um, 
chapter uh, that references critical aquifer recharge areas lays out all of the requirements. The first one is to look at your water source. And so when you're going through a periodic review, you wanna have a level of confidence about, do you have groundwater, especially for drinking water, do you have groundwater sources, surface water, to inventory and map those re resources, and then to have a kind of performance standard, which I think Cara talked about earlier um, with fish and wildlife areas, but it's similar for Cara. And then susceptibility is, you know, start with the water sources and the susceptibility overlays that geology, right? So you're thinking about, do I have unconsolidated deposits? Do I have um, additional vulnerability? Do you have contamination sources that exist? And so ecology has a whole um, online database of contaminated sites and facility site um, data that's available spatially that you can look at that. And then development requirements tie into susceptibility. What does your local code allow if you're in a city and you're thinking about how to regulate critical aquifer recharge areas, not having, looking at your comprehensive plan and thinking about land use, not having industrial land use right over your critical aquifer recharge area is important. And then protection is about those different tools. So some of it is siting, some of it's pollution prevention, um, inspections and monitoring kind of go together and then thinking about the vulnerability, which is the, the land use um, element. So this is the uh, characterize your groundwater in eight easy steps from the Department of Ecology. Uh, again, it's not a DOH publication, but it is something that we reference and and it was updated just last year. So really helpful. Um, a lot of detail in here talking about the steps to go through to really look at your uh, groundwater risk. And, and this would be, you know, in a periodic uh, update, something to really start with, you know, um, if you're leading the periodic update to feel like you have you're maintaining that availability for drinking water sources. You're maintaining that base flow um, and, and just going back through these eight steps and looking at the updated guidance for more information. Thinking about qualified professional assistance, you really want to um, <clears throat> make sure that you're using a professional hydrogeologist that's licensed in Washington state. A lot of, so my background is working in, in the municipal level. Um, I was with the city of Vancouver for many years, and we had planners and we had civil engineers, but we did not have a hydrogeologist on staff. So if you're thinking about your periodic update and looking at your critical aquifer recharge area, you really need that, um, that additional technical assistance to delineate and characterize your uh, aquifers to look at fate and transport. And if you talk to your civil engineers about fate and transport, that's when you'll, you'll probably get a lot of support to, to, um, consult with a hydrogeo because fate and transport makes people nervous. And then modeling, you know, thinking about modeling um, groundwater flow, that's where you really need a hydrogeologist. And then other activities for professional assistance, there's planning, pollution prevention, education outreach, and then enforcement, thinking about that um, as a professional assistance, um, you know, ongoing monitoring. So I know we've talked about best available science and there's been some links, but when we're thinking about critical aquifer recharge areas, there, this is the Venn diagram of Safe Drinking Water Act and critical aquifer recharge areas. Because best available science, when you're looking at the drinking water um, zones of contribution, so the time of travel in, in our map, um, it's this bullseye, right? A calculated fixed radius on the far left, um, water that gets into the ground and how quickly it goes to that drinking water well. But we have modeling available and in increasing levels of complexity to look at how the soils, groundwater flow, you know, to really tie in your site-specific characteristics. So ask the question of your local water system, especially if you're not in a municipality and you're not the drinking water provider, ask that question of your utility. What competent science is available? If they're still using calculated fixed radius, we really want to encourage going to a modeling approach. Um, and that's something that DOH pays, uh, has grants to help pay for. Um, so it's it's really about leveraging the critical aquifer recharge area updates to bring in your utility partners and think about um, what is best available science for your specific uh, geology and groundwater. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of characterization examples um, just to kind of give this uh, a more tangible understanding. Uh, this is Thurston County. So their critical aquifer recharge areas are delineated by soil type. And so there's a huge amount of, of complexity and diversity in their 
um, and their overlay, but you can see the color coding in this map, the extreme um, risk and down to low. And so they're really looking at those really high permeable soils. Um, whatever is on the land is going to get down into those aquifers when you have high permeable soils and groundwater that's that's moving quickly. So this is a really good example of integrating that not having just a one size fits all. It's really integrating your site specific characteristics and your aquifer conditions to have requirements that, that make sense for your local jurisdiction. Um, so this is one example. And the geology here is related to glacier deposits. And so, you know, Thurston County is aware of that soil and, and has a, that um, overlay available, that level of detail. It's a really um, nice example. This is another example. Um, the landscape scale pattern here is uh, alluvial. And so rather than glaciers in Thurston County, Clay Elm has, um, you know, related to the way the river is flowing, but still unconsolidated deposits, right? And so those soils are more at risk for contamination. And the Washington Geologic Survey um, has their soil maps available if you aren't familiar with yours or haven't looked in a little while. So this is what Clay Elm looks like. A lot of unconsolidated, you know, just throughout the, the not as complex as Thurston County, but you can still see that throughout their jurisdiction, it's unconsolidated, so a high risk. And the red dot is their um, jurisdiction boundaries. And so here's an overlay of the mapped water systems. And this is what I was talking about, those bullseyes. So if I was working in Clay Elm and updating the critical aquifer recharge area, if you aren't the water provider, you want to reach out to the utilities and say, is this really the way it runs? Because when I look at the soils map, it's more you know linear across these bands of alluvium. Um, what Clay Elm adopted was uh, they have the whole city is a critical aquifer recharge area. So any project that comes in for development, they're going to review it for risk to the aquifer because they have all these unconsolidated soils, right? They just, when you look at those bands of, of alluvium, it's across the whole city. And then they have pockets of higher risk. And those are related to the drinking water wells in particular on a calculated fixed radius. So this is a good combination of the two. Um, and there's links in this presentation to look at these um, examples. And just quickly on implementation and monitoring. So implementation of critical aquifer recharge areas really is thinking about uh, on the ground, um, how do you leverage these programs in an effective way? So your jurisdiction or maybe you have a partner with the county, maybe doing all of these different kinds of site visits, right? Between stormwater, hazardous materials, the fire marshal, um, fast oils and grease with the sewer system, you know, there may be all these overlapping site visit requirements. So how are you leveraging those to protect your aquifer and to long-term make sure that you've got um, clean and reliable drinking water? When you're doing a periodic update, my recommendation would be to look and see if you've given yourself enough authority to really protect the aquifer. Do you require as the jurisdiction with the critical area, do you require pollution prevention? Spill cleanup by the operator or the owner. Think about that, um, the nuance that's, that's available in that. Do you have the right of entry? Do you have the right of abatement? Do you have a cost recovery system? Um, do you have the authority to collect samples of groundwater, of stormwater, if contamination is accepted, uh, suspected? And to develop procedures, give yourself that authority to the, the right of entry, all these requirements, and then develop procedures to inspect, follow up and monitor and leverage other partners if you need to. Uh, but think about having a roster of cleanup companies. If you're, if you have a spill in your jurisdiction, who do you call? Who does your operations group call? Do you have sampling staff that are available? Do you need to contract that out? And do you have a hydrogeologist that you can tag in to do project review if you feel like um, there's additional complexity that really needs that um, technical assistance. And so here's an example. <clears throat> the toxic cleanup sites where groundwater contamination is either confirmed or suspected. And Ecology's Toxic Cleanup Program has a, a whole list of these sites. They have a map overlay that's, a, that's available. Um, the cleanup sites are, are all um, registered, even if they aren't an active cleanup, even if they're awaiting cleanup. It's important to know where contamination has occurred to prevent additional cleanup from occurring and to look at this land use. If you have a new project come in, 
um, you know, where are you going to want to cite those in relation to these other projects? And when you're thinking about even something like, so petroleum products, you know, could be even just something like a gas station, um, you know, uh, lubricants, something like that. If there's a spill, do you have uh, the authority to go on site? Do you have the authority to grab samples? Um, really think about are you contributing, are you helping to prevent additional contamination in these areas? Adaptive management is built into the Implementation Growth Management Act requires continuing review. We're going to talk about adaptive management later. For monitoring, you really want to follow up whether the permit requirements were um, met. Uh, you want to have inspections, whether it's with code enforcement or your, or your own staff uh, for your critical areas requirements, uh, maintaining those contaminant inventories, having um, potentially partnering with fire marshal inspection, and then, you know, leveraging where you can. Um, pollution prevention is much, much easier than cleanup. <laughs> uh, and so additional monitoring, this is below the ground, right? So above ground, you can do all those inspections, you can be looking for things, you can have eyes out in the field, but then you also want to have monitoring that's available. Uh, do you, is there groundwater in your area? Um, is there data that's available? The USGS has the water quality portal. Ecology has EIM. There's a lot of groundwater data out there, so you can avail yourself of resources that have already been compiled. You don't have to conduct your own additional testing. And then if you do have um, concerns about local groundwater areas, if you have contamination, consider a monitoring program. There may be exa existing wells that you can sample from or in property transfers, you can add that as a requirement and follow up if there are detections of contamination. The voluntary stewardship program is a, it dovetails the critical aquifer recharge area, but it's really for agricultural areas. And counties can opt into this on a voluntary basis you can see the wetlands and buffers. Um, you can measure how they're functioning, looking at groundwater contamination, even if you don't know the exact source, um, you know, it's, it can be really important to prevent those um, and, and to make, the, make sure that you're familiar that the terms um, in the CARAs are, are not equivalent in a voluntary stewardship program. So there's, here's some additional links that'll be in the presentation on a voluntary stewardship program. If you're not in an urban area, maybe something to look into working with your conservation district for additional protection members. And just thinking about, you know, wrapping up, thinking about what is the ground like where your drinking water is now or in the future, if you may have a declining aquifer in your area, do you have people relying on that groundwater for drinking water, whether they're public water systems or private wells? What potential contamination sources are there now or could come up in the future? How will you track? How will you know? And of course, Prevention is always cheaper than cleanup, and you want to make sure that you have a uh, reliable recharge into the future. So there's a lot of links in this slide deck. I uh, hope those will be provided to you. Um, here, you can always contact me with the Washington State Department of Health for more information. And I am going to stop sharing and pass the mic oops, to Scott McKinney with the Washington State Department. Department of Ecology. Thanks, Nikki. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to admit I'm learning a lot this morning. I hope others are as well. This is not my normal uh, feel to do the CAO piece. Um, and the first thing that jumps out at me, I, at first I should say I'm Scott McKinney with the Washington Department of Ecology, the floodplain management unit. Um, the first thing that jumps out at me is that the the regulations really almost default to the National Flood Insurance Program for best available science. That doesn't mean there isn't other things out there, uh, but it's certainly highly reliant upon it. And my experience with the NFIP tells me that avoidance and minimization, which we've heard several people talk about, um, is really not something that uh, is taken into consideration. It really starts with mitigation. Um, so just an observation from somebody who's a little bit new to this. So let me start my slideshow here. Okay. Well, the other things uh, that I should mention is my uh, internet connection has been cutting out. It cut, tends to come back pretty fast. So if I freeze up or stop talking, uh, just hang in there for a few seconds and I should be right back.
All right. So uh, the other, oh, one more thing for Maggie and Trisha. Uh, this is probably not going to take as long as the, the previous presentations have taken. This this piece on frequently flooded areas is really pretty straightforward. Um, so expect me to go faster than others have so far. So here are the laws and the regulations about floodplain uh, management in Washington state. The first one here, 8616 and the associated WAC 158 uh, are really about the authorities of the Department of Ecology and our duties as the state agency delegated authority for floodplain management. It talks about our relationship to FEMA and the NFIP and other things. So probably not so important to local government. The next two probably are um, 8612 to start with that one is about the ability for local government to uh, essentially assess levies and collect taxes to do floodplain management work. Likewise, 8615 is the newer version of that that uh, really lays out the rules about how that can happen. So if you're interested in doing a flood control zone district, uh, these are the two you wanna take a look at. The last one here is, uh, it says state participation in flood control maintenance, which what, what it really means is that the state runs a, a grant program called the Flood Control Assistance Account Program and the associated WAC there. Uh, that program provides grants that are sort of on the scale of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to do uh, primarily floodplain management planning. So that's a great place. It's very likely that your communities, uh, many of them have participated in that in the past. It was uh, not operating for 12 years, so six state biennia. It was underfunded to the point we could not provide pass-through grants. We managed to get it back uh, just last biennium, so this biennium, and it's coming back again. Uh, so you will see in uh, December 6th, so about a week from now, we will issue a notice of funding opportunity for that program. So keep your eyes open for that. Those notices will go to the designated community uh, state flood coordinator or floodplain administrator, as we call them. So watch for a grant program opportunity there. So some simple definitions here, uh, and I'm not going to read these to you, but you know, the, when we say floodplain in general, we really are talking about the geomorphic floodplain. Um, you know, the land area that it's reasonably expected that during high water events, that's where the water is going to go. Uh, the special flood hazard area, on the other hand, or the FEMA floodplain, is a modeled floodplain. Uh, that's the 1% chance or the once in 100 years, which is a tremendous misnomer uh, for folks. Um, but that's a model floodplain. It creates the the regulatory area. And then the last one is the channel migration zone. And I'm probably freezing up for folks right about now. Um, anyway, the channel migration zone, uh, which is created through your local plans and uh, really the SMA process. Uh, Another side note on that, Ecology was given a proviso to hire a hydrogeologist to more fully advance, I'll say, uh, the methodology for channel migration zone creation and mapping. That person literally just came on board. I'm, I'm gonna meet them this afternoon. So uh, in the next year or so, we hope to have some new guidance out on how uh, to do channel migration zone mapping. Um, so another, another tool on its way to watch for. So since the, this, the frequently flooded areas does, in, in a sense, default to the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, and I'll and I'll caution that doesn't mean you're not required to do best available science. You still are 
just that much of it may have been established for you. The, the basic components are the floodplain map, and that's the map that identifies that special flood hazard area. The floodplain development regulations, and this one jumps out at me. Um, I spend a lot of my time running the floodplains by design grant program, which is um, you know tens of millions of dollar grants. And we're always just trying to prevent people from building in the flood zone in the first place. We're, we're, we're starting with avoidance. Um, the NFIP tells you if you're in that flood zone, here's how you must build there. So, you know, a, a different approach. Does it help? Yeah, but it helps because the construction standards are good. Um, but it's not saying don't build there. It, it's saying this is how you can build there. Uh, flood insurance, which was actually the basic, the basis of the original historical program, was to provide insurance for people who essentially were already in a flood zone or had, uh, you know, little opportunity to uh, to get out of there. So that's what the insurance piece is. Uh, ecology participates in the mapping piece of this and the enforcement of the development regulations we really don't get involved in the insurance side of the shop. FEMA really handles that entirely on their own. Um, and then hazard mitigation planning and implementation. So there's the federal level where FEMA and the Washington Military Department's Emergency Management Division are engaged. And then ecology is a part of that team. Uh, but as I just said earlier, the Flood Control Assistance Account Program 86.26 is the state version of the planning, and it's frankly more progressive than what the federal standards are. So in creating floodplain maps, and uh, I'll just kind of summarize these last three bullets here, FEMA creates the maps. The, the state uh, is a participant in the sense that we are paying attention and are aware of what's going on. We help the communities understand what's going on. But the maps are created by FEMA. Any appeal to the mapping process is run by them. And it can take a long time to get a new map. Lucky for us in Washington, uh, over the last more than a decade now, um, we've been very lucky to get enough funding to do a lot of updating and bringing old paper maps essentially into the digital age. So in the past, you might have heard the, the term firm or flood insurance rate map. And now you'll hear the term DFIRM, which is a digital flood insurance rate map. Um, vastly superior products in terms of the technology that it uses, in terms of the information that it provides. Um, so a lot of you might have a new D firm that came along prior to uh, your previous work on your CAOs and the FFA. So take a look at that. If you have one, you're pretty much required to update to that new map. Um, the mapping is based on historic hydrology and it's a model. So it does not take climate change into consideration and FEMA has been very clear about that in spite of a lot of outcry. Uh, we still hope that maybe we can move that, uh, but it hasn't moved yet. The other thing that I'll say about th this idea of historic hydrology, it doesn't take into account um, any essentially obstructions. People who work in this arena, we talk about it in the sense of, well, it, it's a clean floodplain. If there's a landslide, if there's a tree that gets jammed up under a bridge, any number of other things that could happen during a big high water event, that's not mapped. Uh, and that can send water into places that the map didn't think it was gonna go or didn't predict that it was going to go. So something to keep in mind there. 
And lastly, the maps anymore are done on a county by county basis. For a long time, they were done essentially on a river basis or even a smaller jurisdiction. And, you know, I would love personally, I would love to see it be done on a watershed basis. Um, but it's not. It's a county by county. And that makes some good sense in the sense that at least you have a single jurisdiction that's, you know, managing that that process. So the regulations are in the CFR. The state law essentially adopts the FEMA NFIP minimum standards. The exception in Washington state is that we do not allow residential development in the mapped floodway. The key there is the mapped floodway. Not all maps, many of the new ma maps, thankfully, the D firms do have mapped floodways, but not all of them. Um, so you've got to be careful about that. The state standard is higher when it comes to the floodway. Uh, and I should I should add that there probably should have been a definition. The floodway is the port the portion of the floodplain that's going to carry the high and fast flowing water. So essentially the river channel itself in the areas immediately around it. Uh, the NFIP is primarily concerned with how buildings are constructed. So that's what I was talking to earlier is it doesn't say don't build here. It says if you build, if you want to build here, here's how to build there. Um, and I, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to talk about uh, codes in a, in a second here. The NFIP don't, does not cover infrastructure. So when you're doing your planning, your local planning, or DOTs coming in and putting through something, that's all up to you on how to do that. The NFIP is not going to instruct you. Most people anymore are wise enough to say, well, we're going to build to at least what we expect a hundred year or the 1% annual chance to be. A lot of areas are going to 500 year of, or, or higher event. So 0.2%, uh, I guess, chance. Um, it, it does talk about impacts. This is an interesting bullet. I'm inheriting this from a coworker who retired uh, just recently. It, it is not necessarily directly concerned about what you do and how it impacts your neighbor. Maybe not officially, but unofficially, it's becoming more common. For example, one approach to getting up and above the flood is to simply put a pad in, right? You you build the make your building site five feet higher than surrounding land. Your neighbors may not appreciate that, depending on what it does to the flow of the water uh, and the storage capacity and the depths that they might experience. But in general, uh, that's that's unfortunately true of the regulations. Um, and lastly, in spite of several lawsuits and court required uh -huh. consultations uh, over ESA, FEMA continues to take a stance that they are essentially running an insurance program with construction standards. They are not concerned with environmental effects. Uh, which, of course, is a huge problem for us here in Washington State. Uh, so there, if you're in the Puget Sound Basin, there is the Puget Sound Biological Opinion from NOAA that lays out some approaches to how you can respond to that. FEMA has been very clear that the onus is on local government who are, who are responsible for implementing the NFIP. So... Uh, but again, it, it, at the base level, and I think really at maybe the headquarters level, FEMA and the NFIP are not here to save salmon. Um, that's not their primary, their uh, mission. This, uh, you've, you've seen before, this is, others have covered this. So this is essentially why we're here today, and I'm focusing on frequently flooded areas. 
some more of the same. This is basically why we're here. In getting ready for this, uh, I took a look at some of these wax. And, you know, the frequently flooded area subject to last 1% or greater chance of flooding in any given year, that jives really directly with the FEMA standard for mapping. Um, this is the definition of what constitutes best available science is uh, quite detailed. So I would take a close look at that. Um, and the reason being, there's a number of sources of other information besides the FEMA maps. And I'll just give you a couple of examples here. Uh, NOAA and the University of Washington have a sea level rise, have sea level rise data and viewers. The Department of Natural Resources has tsunami mapping. Uh, the channel migration zones, which are usually developed in concert with your SMA work. Some counties, like Thurston, where I live, have mapped high groundwater. And then lastly, the private sector has started to get involved, uh, particularly a, a, a group called the First Street Foundation, who's done, basically they came in and said, we're going to use different methodology to map flood hazards. That is that is not the same as FEMA's. And it's it's revealing what they found. I'm not convinced that it's all uh, you know, the best to use, but just so you know that, that those those things are out there. So this is what I just said about the best available science requirements, the guidebook others have mentioned already. And where you can find it, it's at Commerce Growth Management Services. So we really, ecology really emphasizes trying to go above and beyond. Uh, frankly, because the NFIP will allow you to develop your floodplain quite extensively, potentially. Um, it's not going to consider climate change. It, it rarely in actual implementation considers the cumulative impacts of growth in the flood hazard area or the floodplain. So we really encourage people to try, you know, basically adopt higher standards, which, which you have the, the complete right to do. Uh, freeboard, which is on the left there, that's you know, simply elevating up above where the flood water's depth will go. Uh, and then the other one is, just don't build there, um, especially in the floodways and the channel migration zones, for very obvious reasons, I, I hope. So now we're getting into the actual, you know, the ordinance pieces of this. There's basically two ways to do it. You can have your ordinance, your flood damage prevention ordinance, which covers the NFIP requirements. And then you can have your CAO frequently flooded area ordinance separate from that, or you can try and put them together. There's ups and downs to doing those uh, one way or the other. The upside is everybody knows where to look for floodplain regulations and ordinance. And we hope that because the CAO piece, because of its, its crossover with the other uh, areas that we've just heard about and are yet to hear about, there's potentially a better opportunity to say, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm not so concerned about frequently flooding here, but I've got other concerns about habitat, about critical aquifer recharge, uh, about wetlands, other things. So that's there's a potential for that to, to be a better mechanism for folks. The caution is we've run into this with FEMA where they might reject an ordinance that's that they can't quite discern exactly what pieces belong to the NFIP and what pieces belong to the critical areas ordinance. 
Uh, and of course, you have to address the FEMA standards. So um, I imagine that most of you are, are inheriting a program that's already in an ordinance somewhere. Uh, so that decision may have been made for you, uh, or your managers may be asking you to consider it anew. So um, just some, some thoughts there on what works and what doesn't work. Uh, this is more about the what the NFIP regulations do. It creates uh, basic building standards. You can always adopt higher standards, and FEMA increasingly, especially Region 10, uh, does promote the pursuit of higher standards. Uh, there are engineering standards for how things are constructed. Uh, there are minimal, I'll say minimal floodway standards, in, and that's odd in itself to me to say, here's where the water is going to get really deep and move really fast, but here's what might be able to do uh, and again in washington state we just say don't build there just just don't build uh it's got a lot of structure behind it right it's the code of federal regulations um and it is aligned with the building codes including the international building codes and that's been a movement that's been going on for the last 10 or 15 years uh, so I believe in Washington State, we essentially adopt the, the International Building Code that incorporates the NFIP regs into it. So if you're following the IBC, uh, you're probably complying with the, the, the building code standards. Critical area regulations can uh, address other things like climate change. And of course, we, we promote that. Uh, higher standards, which we also promote. Uh, mapping additional flood hazard areas. It's rare for us on the ecology side to look at the special flood hazard area map and say, that's absolutely where all the water goes. And when we talk to the locals, that's what gets confirmed for us is, no, you're right. Historically, we've had water in other places. Um, so we, when you shoot for a higher standard in your CAO, um, first of all, the NFIP is not going to get in your way. They're, they'll be happy about that. Um, but it gives you the opportunity to say, you know, basically, why not use historical? If it's historically flooded there, you know it's gonna, it can go there again if you're not actively preventing it from going in. So pursue a higher standard. This CAOs are a great opportunity to do that, whether or not you put it into your NFIP flood prevention ordinance. Uh, you can address the channel migration and it needs to, of course. And then uh, the other concerns from the other folks, other areas we've heard from this morning in CAOs, uh, you know, the crossover there, it's your chance to say, look, I'm not just concerned with meeting a base uh, FEMA CFR developed and regulation. Uh, I'm concerned with other, other issues as well. And here are, and I'll, I'll let folks know, re I'll remind folks, I guess, uh, you're going to get the slide decks from all of us, so you do not need to try to write this down in a hurry. Um, you'll you'll have it, but these are our regional floodplain management specialists. They are available uh, to take your calls and talk about how you're putting your ordinance together. We will uh, have to review them for me from the FFA side and the NFIP side. Um, and then commerce and others will will do the other reviews. But our folks, although we've got a pretty good batch of new people here, they they do they're they're getting uh, they put their feet under them, and they've been through this several times before, uh, primarily because anytime a new flood map is issued by FEMA, the ordinance has to be updated to adopt that new map. So. 
we we see these things a lot more frequently than uh, you know the uh, GMA driven update process. So here's your resources. I should also mention, not on this slide, uh, Jerry Franklin with Ecology Floodplain Management Units is the risk map coordinator for Washington State. So he works very closely with FEMA on the mapping processes, how it works, what it means, uh, if they can be appealed, those kinds of things. If there's a new map for your area, any of that. So. Unfortunately, I didn't get that on here, but we can provide Jerry's information uh, as well. And as we learned earlier, um, we will take questions later on, but that's what I have for you this morning. So now I'm going to pass it off to Tricia Sears with the Department of Natural Resources to talk about geologic hazards. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. All right, let me share my screen. All right, can you guys see that? Yes, it looks great. Okay, hey Maggie, um, I did time this around 15, 16 minutes. Are we still good with that? Yeah, I think we're good. We'll have a bit of a compressed Q&A, but if people want to keep asking questions, we can always answer questions via email after today's event. Okay. I can also talk briskly, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, well, thanks everyone. My name is Tricia Sears. I'm the Geologic Planning Liaison with the Washington Geological Survey. And I'm really excited to be here today and to share with you information that um, Washington Geological Survey, or as I will often say, WGS, um, has available to share with you. <clears throat> I can make sure that my arrows to work. There we go. All right. So today I'll go over uh, Washington Geological Survey's hazard programs and products that might be of use to you in developing plans, delineating critical areas, and revising or creating implementation provisions. Some of you know, but I will note that the Washington Geological Survey is a part of the Department of Natural Resources, or DNR. We are mandated to collect and distribute information to protect the health and safety of the people of Washington, protect the environment, and support its economy. We have about 50 people at WGS who work on geologic hazards and regulate surface mine reclamation. <laughs> so now you know a little bit more about who WGS is. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> With that in mind, let's note that geologically hazardous areas are defined by WAC 365, 190, 120 in subsection 3 as areas that are susceptible to one or more of the following hazards, erosion hazard, landslide hazard, seismic hazard, and areas subject to other geological events, such as coal mine hazards and volcanic hazards, including mass wasting, debris flows, rock falls, and differential settlement. Washington has an impressive landscape with numerous geologic hazards. The main hazards are earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and landslides. Three of these four are shown on the map that you see on the screen. <clears throat> Some of these hazards affect the entire state, while others impact parts of the state more than others. <clears throat> Generally speaking, the western half of the state is vulnerable to more and higher severity hazards than the eastern part of the state, and I should say geologic hazards, to be specific. <clears throat> so on the map, you can see the green shaded areas show volcanic hazard areas from our five major stratovolcanoes, which are part of the Cascade Mountain Range. The white lines show major crustal faults, faults <clears throat> thought capable of producing damaging earthquakes, and the white circles show damaging earthquakes since 1871. We also have a major subduction zone off our coast that can produce mega thrust earthquakes with high shaking intensity especially on the western half of the state. So <clears throat> during most of this talk, I'm going to be referencing our geologic information portal. It's one of the resources that I'd encourage you to check out first when you need to know what hazards are in your area. This map application contains all of the data we produce and allows you to view, navigate, and learn about all facets of Washington geology and hazards. We want you to have the best available science for your decision making. 
With the controls in the portal, you can print, turn layers on and off, change base maps, measure distances, and annotate. You can even add your own GIS data into your session or download any of the data on the portal for use in your own GIS. So this view of the portal shows a statewide overview of some of the earthquake hazards data. It shows our inventory of active faults, which are faults that are known or suspected to produce earthquakes. Washington has three different kinds of earthquakes, <clears throat> crustal, deep, and subduction zone. These are shown as the blue lines you see on the map, along with liquefaction potential, which is shown in the shaded areas. <coughs> Sorry. These available layers are listed in the table of contents. And from there, you can toggle them on or off, change their transparency, and find additional resources. <laughs> this is a zoomed in view of the Duwamish River Valley and Renton, showing the liquefaction potential and historical, <clears throat> historical earthquake damage that we've compiled. You can see that the loose river valley sediment here is highly susceptible to liquefaction, and that is correlated by much of the earthquake damage <clears throat> being located within the warmer colors of the map. <laughs> All right, we also distribute seismic scenarios, which display projections of damage and loss from 20 different earthquakes across the entire state from various faults. This particular map shown here is a cascade subduction zone earthquake scenario. Uh, the catalog of seismic scenarios also includes the crustal and deep scenario, excuse me, crustal and deep earthquakes that I mentioned earlier. Some of the scenarios are included on our portal. And the entire catalog of scenarios can be found at the link that I show on the slide. Now, I can tell you that these scenarios are due for a little bit of an update, and we've got that in the works. And probably in the next two years, we'll have those um, sorted and uh, updated for you. <clears throat> tsunamis. All of the Washington coastline is susceptible to tsunamis. WGS has mapped and modeled the entire coast. WGS produces several tsunami products that we develop and share with local communities. You can see the on-land inundation, evacuation routes, tsunami sirens, and post-event assembly areas in the products. You can also access all of our publications and evacuation materials right from the portal. <clears throat> so these maps uh, shown here are for Westport. And on the left, you'll be able to see my cursor, but on the left here is the tsunami hazard map which shows the depth of the water inundation with the darker blue colors being the deepest. <clears throat> and we note the actual value of modeled inundation at select points on the map. To the right is the corresponding pedestrian evacuation map showing how long it would take to evacuate on foot from any given spot on the map to go to higher ground. At the northernmost tip of the peninsula, it would take between 31 and 45 minutes to walk to safety but the arrival time of the wave is modeled at 25 minutes. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why the Ocosta School Vertical Evacuation Structure was built in 2016. So you can see that on the map here on this, on this map. And, uh, and then, of course, correspondingly, if you look at the walk map, then your walk times are uh, greatly enhanced when you have the vertical evacuation structure um, close by. <clears throat> So as of the adoption of the 2018 Washington Building Code, new construction um, of risk category three and four facilities within the tsunami design zone must be constructed to withstand loads <clears throat> from tsunamis. So the tsunami design zone is the tsunami inundation zone. And you can find that map again at the link that I show on the screen. The photograph is the Auntie Lee tsunami vertical evacuation structure that was built in Tilton, Washington was built for the Showalter Bay Tribe, and it's a risk category four structure that used the new building code design. And that actually just opened uh, this year, a couple months back. And this particular structure was the second structure built in Washington of this kind. Um, and the Ocosta structure that I mentioned in the previous slide was actually the first vertical evacuation structure built in the entire uh, United States, which is kind of cool. Um, and so just to note, uh, uh, future building codes will continue to have updated um, map design information. 
the more we learn, the more we want to share and, uh, and see provisions that can be useful. <clears throat> so as mentioned earlier, there are five major stratovolcanoes in Washington, forming the core of the Cascade Mountain Range that divides the state. These volcanoes are classified as high threat and very high threat. <clears throat> and more and more communities are encroaching in these hazard areas. About half a million people live in the volcano hazard zones in Washington. Between 1990 and 2010, po population expansion into Lahar hazard zones increased by 50,000 residents. These volcanoes are capable of producing debris avalanches, pyroclastic flows, and lava flows. The hazards typically affect the slopes of the volcanoes. <clears throat> Much more hazardous are the haars, which are known as volcanic mud flows and ash. These can travel much farther away from the flanks of the volcano. <clears throat> Here's a view of some of the data on our portal, where you can see in more detail what communities are affected by this hazard. In this example, which shows Mount Rainier, you can see that <coughs> excuse me, Nisqually, Tacoma, Fife, Sumner, and many other communities are at risk for Lahars. WGS has a lot of great information to share about volcanoes, but we're not actually the lead in volcanic hazards. Uh, the United States Geological Survey, or USGS, Cascade Volcano Observatory, researches, monitors, and provides alerts for all of the volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. WGS works in a supporting role and provides consistent data for Washington in partnership with USGS. Landslides. In Washington, there are thousands of landslides and many of them happen far from people. However, many landslides do affect people and when that happens, they're often expensive and sometimes deadly. This image shows a timeline of notable landslides in Washington. The timeline shows the largest landslide in North America, which was the 1980 debris avalanche of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. It also shows the 2001 Nisqually earthquake landslides, which caused $34 million in damages. And it also shows the 2014 Oso landslide, which killed 43 people and caused $80 million in damages. <clears throat> We produce a landslide inventory database for Washington State, which contains two different types of landslide information. The two um, detailed, excuse me, the two are the detailed inventory, <clears throat> which is also known as the WGS protocol landslide mapping, and also there is the compilation mapping. WGS has a landslide hazards team, which maps landslides, creates inventories, conducts emergency response to landslide emergencies, conducts education and outreach, and performs hazard assessments in communities affected by wildfire. In 2017, this team developed a new protocol for hazard, excuse me, for landslide hazard mapping that only maps in areas that have high quality LIDAR coverage. They follow a published and peer reviewed protocol and they field check at least 10% of the landslides that they map. We're approaching these projects on a county by county basis and some of these studies have accompanying susceptibility modeling alongside the landslide inventory. Our goal over the next several years is to ensure that all the counties that we've mapped so far contain all of the landslide hazards. <clears throat> so the last slide um, discussed our WGS protocol landslide mapping. And here we're going to talk about the compilation mapping. This data set is a compilation inventory of landslides that we've gathered from geologic mapping reconnaissance studies, geotechnical reports, and other miscellaneous projects. The data isn't complete or comprehensive. Much of it wasn't field checked and was done with or without LIDAR at various scales by multiple people with varied levels of expertise. So, but despite these limitations and the unclear picture it paints, it still provides a lot of useful information. <clears throat> On the left is a zoomed in view from our portal of just one landslide to show what the data looks like. This is the Van Zant landslide in Whatcom County. <clears throat> we map all the scarps, flanks, and the landslide deposit. On the right is a view from our portal showing where we've published landslide inventories so far, including King, Pierce, Snohomish, and Whatcom counties, and a large portion of the Columbia River Gorge. We are currently working on an alluvial fan data set for Klickitat County to support preparedness for wildfire related debris flow hazards. And we're seeking federal funding for counties in North Central Washington to do the same. 
Alluvial fans and debris flows are landslide hazards. Alluvial fans are landforms that form at the base of narrow canyons or valleys. During a large rain event, all, <clears throat> all the water and a lot of the sediment it picks up in that canyon collects and rapidly exits the canyon, depositing the sediment into a fan-shaped landform. Unfortunately, many people build on these features, and in wildfire-prone areas where vegetation is denuded and soils are baked, these areas are even more dangerous. During the wildfire season, our team, the Wildfire Associated Landslide Emergency Response Team, or WALERT, goes out after the wildfires to assess the debris flow hazards to these communities. As we conduct hazard assessments, we communicate with local communities and we put the reports on our website. <clears throat> Uh, the next couple of slides here are just links or show you the resources that we have at WGS. Um, so I'll put a link to the handouts in the chat after my talk, but there's also a couple of shown on the slides. So um, I've categorized them according to hazard type, and it begins with general purpose resources, <coughs> such as geologic hazard brochures, risk map information in our portal. And then there's a section for LIDAR, which has links to our fact sheet and our LIDAR portal. <clears throat> and then here, the landslide section provides links to our web pages, fact sheets, the Department of Ecology's webpage on Puget Sound landslides, the USGS, the USDA soil conservation map, which has landslide prone soils on it. And then there's also a homeowner's guide to landslides. Um, of note is a document called Preparing for Landslide Hazards, a land use guide for Oregon communities. Was produced by Oregon's Geological Survey, which is called the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, or DEGAMI, and it was also co-produced by the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, or DLCD, which, <clears throat> which provides examples of how they incorporate landslide inventory data into growth management decision making. And um, in full disclosure, I will tell you that I was one of the authors of the document. <laughs> So then we've got um, seismic hazard and tsunami hazard resources. So again, more links to the, the web pages and brochures and maps that we have there. And the, the link is up on the screen there. And again, I'll put that into the chat. And I know that our presentations will be shared out with you. So you have all of this handy. And then just the very last slide. Again, I'm Tricia Sears. I'm the geologic planning liaison. I've really appreciated having the time to be here. I put up um, a flyer that I have on the geologic planning website, which is on the WGS webpage, um, and just urge you to consider if you've got questions about how to integrate geologic planning into the work that you're doing, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. If you want a little more information about the science and kind of information we have, don't hesitate to reach out to us. I've put up Kate and Karina's names there. There are landslide hazards and geologic hazards managers. Um, so if you need some super scientific detailed data conversation, they're the, they're the best people to talk to you for that. And that is it. Thank you. Um, so next up is Tara from the Department of Commerce. So I will stop sharing my screen and let her take over from here. Thank you, Trisha. Hi everyone, I am Tari Newman. I am a senior planner with the Department of Commerce's Growth Management Services. I work in our national estuary program, helping to provide tools and resources to integrate Puget Sound recovery priorities into local land use planning. So now that you've heard a little bit about what's new from each of the different critical area types, we wanted to share some information about monitoring and adaptive management of your critical areas regulations and programs. And this is so important because you can have all the right things written into your code to incorporate the best available science, but if your regulations are not being implemented consistently and as they were intended, you might still end up with critical area losses. So we encourage you to consider setting up a monitoring and adaptive management program as you update your comprehensive plans and critical areas ordinances. This is a great time to start getting some supporting policies and language in place within those documents. So what is monitoring and adaptive management? Adaptive management is the process of using a monitoring feedback loop to improve your permits, regulations, and programs. 
So it's essentially a data-driven approach to ensure the protection of critical areas. So you start by identifying key monitoring and management questions that you want to answer. So that could be questions like, did your county or city issue a complete and fully compliant permit? Or did the applicant comply with all the conditions of their permit? Then you design and implement a monitoring program to answer those questions. And you compare the monitoring results with the benchmarks and goals for your community. If your benchmarks and goals are not being met, you would then initiate corrective actions. Those adaptive management actions could include things like additional staff training, revising administrative processes and forms, outreach and education, or revising your regulations. And while those corrective actions are implemented, you would continue to monitor and assess the effects of those actions to see if they were effective and where additional changes might be needed. Decision makers like city managers and county commissioners want monitoring data to show how well certain elements of the critical areas protection process are working, and the benefits of even a modest program can be substantial. Some of those benefits are developing a critical areas program and process that is fair, effective, efficient, and successful. It can help you look at whether your regulations are achieving their goals for the community, improve the quality and speed of your permitting, and provide transparency in the permit process. So it can ultimately help reduce risk from land use impacts and improve ecological outcomes for critical areas protection. Monitoring and adaptive management of critical areas is not a specific requirement of the GMA because critical areas policies and regulations are assumed to be protective if they're based on the best available science. However, this presumes that local programs and regulations are being implemented fully and as intended. We can't know the degree to which the no-net loss standard is actually being met unless we can show that that assumption is true. So we need to be able to show that the regulations are being interpreted consistently and implemented fully. We need to know that the permit conditions are being met and that corrective and precautionary actions are implemented to mitigate for any losses. So developing and implementing a critical areas monitoring and adaptive management program is recommended and we encourage you to start thinking about this during your comprehensive plan update process. Commerce's critical areas guidance focuses on monitoring and adaptive management of permit systems to ensure that permits are consistently issued and implemented according to the code. Permit monitoring alone can't determine whether critical areas protections are successful. Monitoring ecological outcomes is also necessary for this. However, ecological outcomes are often more difficult to monitor and assess, and adaptive management is usually more complex and harder to implement. So we encourage local governments to focus on adaptive management of permits and permit programs first, which is easiest for local governments to administer and can influence many projects through simple changes. So there's two types of permit monitoring defined in Commerce's Critical Areas Handbook and shown here on this slide. Permit implementation monitoring ensures that state and local regulations are followed each time a permit is issued. So it asks whether the local government issued a permit consistent with its regulations and policies, and whether the projects as built comply with all of the conditions noted in the permit. So the data is about individual permits and permit requirements, conditions, and procedures can be improved to protect critical areas as issues arise. Permit effectiveness monitoring ensures that regulations are being implemented consistently over time. So it continues to ask those same two permit implementation monitoring questions, but over a longer time period. And this can start to address compliance issues, as well as help with procedural improvements to improve the efficiency of your permit system. Ecological validation monitoring is the third type of monitoring shown here. And this is of course more focused on measuring ecological parameters. So that is to ensure that projects are not causing unmitigated impacts and that no net loss requirements are met. Once you've determined that your code is being implemented and fully and consistently through your permit monitoring, this can start to uncover deficiencies in the code and answer some of the more complex questions about cumulative impacts of projects, as well as the status and trends of species like salmon. Commerce's guidance, again, focuses on adaptive management of permit systems, but in any case, all types of monitoring and adaptive management are based on the same set of principles. Thoughtful monitoring, defensible data and results, established thresholds for when change is needed, 
and corrective actions that can be implemented to ensure the protection of your critical areas. There are five general steps to developing a critical areas monitoring and adaptive management program. So first you would determine the reasons for monitoring and adaptive management in your community. Then you establish your key objectives and study questions that align with those reasons. Then you would design a monitoring program and determine the monitoring timeframe. And finally, you would evaluate the results and make recommendations for adaptive management. And Commerce's Critical Areas Handbook goes into a lot more detail on what to consider at each of these steps, as well as specific examples of what to monitor and some of the tools that are available for tracking and evaluating those results. And based on the results of your monitoring program, you of course might find that you need to implement some adaptive management strategies to improve critical areas protection in your community. Some common adaptive management strategies that are used by local governments include creating better training programs for staff, so staff are applying regulations consistently, educating applicants and property owners about the permit process, improving the application process and forms, improving monitoring reporting processes, and refining your development regulations so they're easier to apply consistently and correctly. And again, Commerce's Critical Areas Handbook has more information about these strategies and the questions that you might consider when evaluating whether your critical areas program would benefit from some of these improvements. Funding and capacity are always the most common barriers to monitoring and adaptive management for local governments. So we wanted to touch briefly on some of the opportunities for funding this work. Some local governments integrate monitoring into their permit review process so they can use permit fees to pay for their ongoing work. So with some initial investment to put systems in place to track the information that's needed for monitoring as your development applications come in, permit fees can then help to pay for your ongoing staff time for your monitoring program. There are also several state and federal programs that can help support local monitoring and adaptive management programs through grants, resources, and technical assistance. One of those is the Environmental Protection Agency's National Estuary Program. The National Estuary Program's Habitat Strategic Initiative has generously supported the development of Commerce's Critical Areas Guidance and Workshops, as well as more than $2 million in support for recent local projects that are related to monitoring and adaptive management. The Habitat Strategic Initiative currently has a request for proposals open that's very well aligned with this work. So this is an excellent opportunity for local governments to apply for some of the funding that they need. That application window does close soon, but there will be some additional opportunities coming up in the future. And Commerce is also working on a proposal to potentially offer a grant and technical assistance program that would be geared toward helping local governments with this work. So look out for more information on that possibly coming in the next few months. And then I also wanted to mention that the Department of Ecology will have some new funds in the next several years for grants to local governments for shoreline master program periodic reviews. And they expect to fund implementation priorities that include monitoring and adaptive management. And you can find some other funding sources through commerce, other state agencies, federal agencies, tribes, and private funding sources. And then finally, as a resource for more information on this topic, we wanted to point you to chapter seven of Commerce's Critical Areas Handbook, as well as the monitoring and adaptive management webinars that we held last year. The handbook and all of the webinar recordings are available on Commerce's website and an updated version of the Critical Areas Handbook is in the works and should be posted in February. There's a lot of information in the handbook and the webinars on how to set up a program, some great examples of local governments that are already doing this work, and lots of tools and data resources. So this presentation was just a very quick high level overview to hopefully get you thinking about monitoring and adaptive management and how to incorporate it into your planning and to help you take advantage of some of these upcoming funding opportunities and resources to get this important work moving forward at the local level. So thank you so much for your time today and I will pass it back over to Scott to facilitate the Q&A. Thank you, Tara. And in the interest of time, we are going to uh, skip the Q&A today. And um, but if you have any questions, you can follow up directly with any of today's presenters.
or you can email PSRC's plan review email and we will distribute those questions to the presenters. As a reminder, all of today's presentations and the recordings will be available on PSRC's website. And we'll send an email out to everyone who registered for today's event with the link to those, as well as all of the links that were sent in the chat box today and all of the resources available to everyone. We really wanna thank all of the presenters um, and everyone who helped organize this event in the Department of Commerce for helping us put it together. Um, we have one additional, um, two additional questions we want to ask participants as you head out today. Um, just how you're feeling after today's workshop and um, if you have any feedback for us at PSRC. And then if you can stick around, you should be prompted to take our Title VI survey, which is just asking some demographic questions of you. Um, that helps us have a better understanding of who's participating in PSRC events. And we will leave these questions up for about another minute or so, um, and then we'll close the webinar. Thank you so much.